So, whom do we have today? We are really excited about this, frankly. At least I am. Uh, the theme of uh, today is really Gettysburg and Vicksburg. Uh, it is the 150th anniversary of both coming right up. So, for the sesquicentennial, we have Alan Guelzo, uh, who is, of course, at Gettysburg College, professor of the Civil War era and director of the Civil War era studies. He's the author of Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, Abraham Lincoln, Redeemer President, each a winner of the prestigious Lincoln Prize, and other books. Uh, his essays, reviews, and articles have appeared, uh, well, everywhere. So <laughs> his latest book is the one we have today. This is actually the national debut of this uh, fine book, uh, Gettysburg, The Last Invasion, published by Alfred Knopf, 632 pages with 39 maps. And it's $35 and a beautifully crafted book, as I told you before, by the way. Um, and it's just wonderful narrative history, frankly. I think this is really an exciting book. I enjoy this immensely. And uh, I understand that there are some other books on Gettysburg. So this is one of the better ones. In fact, a few. While I have you real quickly, I'm going to ask. Now, 60 years ago, James Randall asked uh, if the Lincoln theme had been exhausted. Well, maybe obviously not, because here we have another book. but. Has the Gettysburg theme, do you think, has all the toothpaste come out of that tube at this point? Randall had the right answer then, and it's the same answer for the Gettysburg question, too. Uh, the reason that Randall's answer, yes, that we can still do more, no, the Lincoln theme has not been exhausted, uh, was that from Randall's day forward, so many more new discoveries have been made, so many new archives have been opened, so many more documents have been made available, and so many different ways of looking at Lincoln have emerged that the Lincoln theme, far from being exhausted, uh, shows no sign of uh, declining even from a golden age, which is really what Lincoln scholarship has been in. Uh, Gettysburg, likewise. Uh, you would think that a battle which lasted only three days as opposed to Lincoln, who lived for you know, 54, 55 years, um, that, that should give you enough to write a lot about. But Gettysburg, it's three days. You know, what can you say further about three days? Uh, how, how can you have more books about a battle than there were actually hours in the battle? Uh, and true enough, there are books that now descend to a level of specificity that concentrate on this 15 minutes of Gettysburg and then the next 15 minutes of Gettysburg. Well, this does not do that. This is really the panorama uh, before, during, and even after that uh, really tells a wonderful story. Uh, we're also with uh, Linda uh, Bar uh, Barnacle, who is a mass has a master degree from University of Wisconsin Madison. Mm -hmm. She's an archivist and a freelance writer interested in local history, military history, and cultural power of archives. Uh, this book, her first, Milliken's Bend, A Civil War Battle in History and Memory, uh, won the 2013 Jules and Francis Landry Award. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, and it's Louisiana University, State University Press, 286 pages, and it's 3795. Briefly, uh, I just want to ask you, what power do archives have in culture? Oh, goodness. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have enough time for that one. Give us a quick overview. Well, um, I guess one, I wrote an article some years ago about uh, the power of archives during war and looked at World War II. And um, archives, just like museums, are cultural treasures. And so you had the, uh, the guys who were in the military who were saving works of art, but they also saved archives. So that's just one little tidbit. All right. Well, archives are, uh, I think, used by both of you greatly, especially new material coming out. Uh, yours because Milliken's Bend is a, is a micro history, and here we have the macro history of uh, Gettysburg. Uh, but they work together 
uh, at least for me in this show uh, especially. Uh, I want to ask you quickly, Alan, about the uh, footnotes, again, very briefly. Uh, you have 120 pages of notes. Is this fallout from Stephen Ambrose and, <laughs> and others that we have to uh, footnote our footnotes at this point? Well, I hope not. Um, I, I have been footnoting very aggressively all of my academic life. And really, Dan, uh, the, the secret story to this, and, and I, I hope this won't go any further than, than you and me and Linda. Oh, yes, whoops, we've got a whole <laughs> audience. All right, well, I guess I'll just spill the beans. I love footnotes. I believe that footnotes have an aesthetic beauty. You know, get in line, they do. And I perceived that beauty for the first time when I was in high school. And I can remember it was an academic paper written by one of my teachers. And it was accessioned in the library. And it had been written, it was a typescript, but it had footnotes at the bottom. And I thought that was gorgeous. And I've really been just imitating that forever yeah, after. <laughs> I have no idea what psychological problem that can be identified as being, and maybe somebody out there will be in, in the virtual book signing uh, will be able to diagnose this and send an email. Um, but whatever it is, that's really what it goes back to. I, I just think footnotes are beautiful. Yeah, footnotes are beautiful, and they give so much more information than you really can put into a narrative, because this just stops the narrative sometimes. Well, that's, that's in fact one reason why some of my footnotes are as long as they are, because they're discussing quote-unquote controversies. Controversies that tend to be the pig and the python, that really do slow the narrative down, tend to be of interest only to the particular controversy nerds of that controversy. So I thought, I am going to put this in the footnotes. They can go find them there. This is a book which is written for someone that really perhaps has never read a campaign history of Gettysburg before. Someone who's coming to the subject, maybe they know something about it, they want to learn some more, but this is a book that really can be read uh, by everyone, and not just the very exacto specialist in those little 15-minute segments. The other part of your book, which is fabulous to me, and did not slow the narrative down, are the number of quotes that you got from people all over the map. And it just flowed with the narrative, brought one, me, very much onto the battlefield. And next to all the people who populate the Gettysburg narrative. Um, I mentioned that you know this is macro and micro history, uh, but both battles had national significance. Each of you maybe briefly talk to me about what is the significance that Millikan's Bend that nobody knows about right. but until now had. Well, Millikan's Bend um, was important because uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one is that the uh, Union force, who were the defenders, uh, was composed pro predominantly of black troops, and not only that, but most of them had been former slaves um, less than a month before the battle occurred. Um, in addition, there were some prisoners taken at the battle, uh, both black and white, because of course the black troops were officered by uh, white men. and. Um, that's one of the controversies, but uh, it's important because it did turn out that um, the rebels did not treat them the same as they would other prisoners from white units during the war, and uh, it contributed to the breakdown of prisoner exchanges between the North and South. Did they treat them out there, any you know, outside of Vicksburg there, any differently than the the other two prominent bookends uh, of Port Hudson and Fort Wagner, which happened in the months uh, preceding and just after Millikan's Bend, did they treat them any differently out there than they did elsewhere? Well, what happened with the prisoners that were taken at Millikan's Bend, the best I can figure out, and I have to say that, you know, there's still more work to be done, mm -hmm. but uh, is that the uh, black soldiers were mostly returned to slavery, um, and the uh, white soldiers, uh, the white officers, two white officers were executed. And um, so that 
that was what started all of this. And for a long time, uh, the Confederates, Richard Taylor says, nothing like this happened. And uh, because Grant had asked him, what's this I hear about prisoners being put to, put to death? And, and Taylor's like, well, I don't know anything about it. And, and I believe he was sincere um, at that point. Um, I also think it could be a technicality. Uh, that they, they may not have been under his command at that particular time. And so he could say, I don't know anything about it. Um, and um, then it kind of brewed up from there. Did, you know, here, we, here they were arming newly minted freedmen. They had just been slaves. Why did they not take retribution as they were gathering north trying to get away from their plantations. Why didn't they take retribution and the slave owners as they left? That's a very good question. And, and um, I, think, I think that one of the reasons is they just wanted to get out of there. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was more important than vengeance. I mean, the ultimate revenge was getting away. And um, so I think that that, that that was a big part of it. Now, you know, certainly there were, you know, Occasions where there was something of that nature that took place, but by and large, they were interested in freedom. You know, freedom or revenge. I think I want freedom. Mm-hmm. 